actividades. La sesión de este momento se llama ¿Cómo crear productos que no sean una porquería? A cargo de Tom Evans. Tom es director en el grupo Lockroom. Además es una autoridad muy reconocida en desarrollo de productos y gestión de productos. Ha ayudado a empresas de Fortune 500 a lanzar productos y es un autor aclamado del taller de la servillera a los ingresos. Bueno, uh, Tom, son todos tuyos. Ok. Y, bueno. Ok. Muchas gracias a todos y buenas tardes. Y mi nombre es Tom Evans y mi español es muy básico. Entonces, uh, de aquí en frente voy a hablar en inglés. Y espero que uh, ustedes puedan ni todo hablar en inglés. So, thank you very much for uh, your participation today. And I will be uh, presenting in English. And I will try not to speak too fast or to use too many uh, slang words so that it's clear uh, what I'll be presenting. But the uh, presentation today will be Como crear productos que no se en una porquería. Or in English, we would say, how to create products that don't suck. And so what I want to do is first introduce to you some of the reasons that uh, many products are unsuccessful in the marketplace. And then show a process that will allow you to discover the right products and the right opportunities so that you can create uh, great products. If we look at statistics in the uh, marketplace, we see that the success rate of new products going into the market is very low. We can see that uh, a couple of quotes here from uh, one from Robert Cooper, who states that one out of four development projects succeeds commercially which means that somewhere around 75% of new product development efforts are failures. Then I have another quote here from Jack Gordon where he says that somewhere between 80 to 95% of new product introductions fail when they're launched into the marketplace. And so what we want to do is to understand why this is the case. Why, why are products, so many products unsuccessful when they are launched into the market. <clears throat> well, in English, we would say that this is because they suck or they're una porquería. So let's look at some of the causes to that. The number one reason that I see products fail so often in the market is because the person who creates the product comes up with an idea and they think that just because they thought of it, it's a brilliant idea. And so they immediately create the product and try to sell it into the marketplace without uh, understanding, does anyone else in the market care uh, about the product that they have just developed? And so many entrepreneurs who create new products go through this process where they think of an idea, they think that they need to create it and bring it into the market, but they never go and check to see whether anyone else uh, cares about the, having that product in the marketplace. Now, another mistake I see is that companies or entrepreneurs hear one person identify an opportunity and they think, well, that is, I can solve that and they go and create a product without really ever validating if more than one person or more than one other company find that to be an important product uh, for them. Another thing that we could do is we could actually have good uh, evidence from the market that there is a need that needs to be solved. We can create the product, confirm that the product solves the need, but in the end, we can still be successful because it takes more than just a good product to be successful in the marketplace. And we're going to discuss what are those components to be successful. 
The fourth point I want to make is we may have taken the product, we've gotten validation from the market that there's a need, we've validated it's a good product, but we don't have a clear strategy for how we are going to market the product in the marketplace. And that can also turn into unsuccessful products. And then the last part is we may have done all of these things correctly, but if we don't have a profitable business model, we still are going to be success unsuccessful in the marketplace. Some of you may be able to remember back to 1998, 1999, 2000, uh, 2001, the period that we called the dot-com period. And there were many companies that came to the market with new products, web-based type products, and thought that they were going to be successful overnight. But in the end, many of them did not have a clear business model on how they were going to be successful. And so, unfortunately, they, were, they failed in the marketplace. And it all ties back to not understanding what their business model was going to look like and how to make that successful. So when we look at products that are successful in the marketplace, there are three components that I like to identify and focus on. The first is that there is a compelling market opportunity. And what that means is that it is that the opportunity you are considering is solving a, a problem that is very painful and it's not just painful for a few people but it's painful for many people and most importantly they are willing to pay to solve the problem that they have but having a compelling market opportunity is not sufficient in itself it is also important that we create a solution that is compelling that means that we have something that is differentiated from our competitors, that there's a very clear value proposition or a, a, a strong uh, value understood by the market for it, that we have a business model that's going to be profitable, and we are able to deliver it to the market in a reasonable time frame. And the last word, uh, the part of this is that we have a compelling market strategy. So not only is it important to have an opportunity that is uh, compelling but, and a good solution, but we also need to be able to persuade those people in the target market that can purchase our product that we can solve that problem for them and that they should go and purchase our solution. So it's when all three of these are aligned and working together we actually can achieve successful products in the market. Now, how do we get there? Well, it takes what I call a discovery and validation process. And so we start out with what we think might be the opportunity, but it's only by going out to the marketplace and speaking with those in the market who could potentially purchase our product, can we really discover what the right opportunity is what the right solution is, and what the right strategy is, and be able to validate that and increase our chances for a successful product in the market. So this is the model for discovery that I've created, and it's based upon four key pillars, and I will highlight those. So there's the four key pillars over here which is the market problem, the product, the business model, and the market strategy. So all three of those have to be uh, defined, understood, and aligned to be successful in the marketplace. And the way that we get there is by going through a discovery process. And that discovery process starts with having a hypothesis that we think is uh, an opportunity in the market. We then validate that hypothesis. We then validate that the opportunity is worthwhile. 
we validate our solution with the potential market and then by their purchase within the marketplace we are able to validate the market and I'll walk through more definition on each of these pillars and those four key steps of discovery. So the four key pillars, the first is a market problem. One of the things that I think is sometimes challenging, especially those who come from a very technical background, is that they think that, the that, it, that we think that the technology is, su is sufficient to be successful with a product or we need to develop a product that is uh, cool or interesting or new. But the reality is, is that any product that is successful in the marketplace is solving a problem. And so the first thing that we need to be able to understand and identify is what is the market problem? Because if we're not solving a problem, there is no need for the product that we are offering. And so that's the number one starting point for anything else that we need to do is that clear understanding of the market problem. Then we need to define the product and the business model that will appropriately allow us to address that market problem. So the product has to solve the market problem in a valuable way so the person who is buying it has to recognize that this is valuable to me and it solves my problem. But we also want to make them choose our product instead of other alternatives in the market. And so we need to have a clear differentiation of why they should consider our product versus the others. Then we have to make sure that we understand how we're going to deliver the product and capture the value from that and do that in a profitable manner. And so that is what I would call the business model. So it's a clear understanding of here are the steps and the processes and the capabilities that we need to deliver our product to the marketplace and then understand how much it's going to cost to do that and ensure that we are able to sell our product or more than what it cost us to deliver it. So having that profitable business model is part of that. There are some cases where our business model will actually be part of our differentiation. Are the things that will uh, help us be more successful with the product. And so there are opportunities to innovate and differentiate ourselves with both the product and the business model. The last part of these pillars are the, is the market strategy. With the market strategy, this is defining who is going to buy our product and why they are product, or why they're going to buy it. Without a clear definition of that, we end up investing our marketing resources, which are often limited, and investing them across too many different activities or too different many uh, market segments. And so by having a clear definition around our market strategy, we are able to go and clearly define who we want to target and effectively communicate our marketing to that particular target market. The other part of this is we want to be able to communicate why they should purchase our product versus other alternatives. So those are all part of what goes into the market strategy. So again, the starting point for a successful product is having a clear market problem, being able to find a product and a business model which will allow you to compete, deliver the value and be profitable, and then finally have a clear market strategy identifying who you're going to sell to and why they're going to buy your product versus something else. Now we want to look at the, uh, the discovery process and we'll walk through uh, all four of those steps. One of the key points I want to emphasize 
about this discovery process is that it is a uh, it is a discovery process, and so sometimes we'll go forward and learn something, and then we may have to step back. We may have to go around and around some of these phases multiple times before we identify the right opportunity uh, and the right product to match that opportunity. But most important with all of this is that we want to ensure that we keep the customer or our potential customer at the center of these activities and make sure that we understand uh, those potential customers. So to get started, what typically happens with many uh, companies or entrepreneurs is that they identify some market evidence. And when I talk about market evidence, this can be a customer identifying here's a problem that we would like to solve. Or it may even be a, a non-customer who identifies an issue or a problem that they would like to address. We may identify changes going on in the marketplace that look like there is some evidence for an opportunity. We, we in our company or as entrepreneurs may develop new technologies and we say this is an opportunity because of the new technology. We can watch our competitors and uh, hear what they are uh, or watch what are, they are doing and use that as evidence for uh, a new opportunity. And there are times that our own personal experience can serve as the source of uh, market evidence. But what many people do is they get that source of market evidence and they immediately use that to start building and developing a product for that. And so what I want to say is, you know, that is not what we want to do because this is just the starting point. We have some evidence of a market problem, but all that is at this point in time is a hypothesis. And so the starting point of our validation and discovery process is by clearly defining a potential hypothesis that could lead to a market opportunity. So this is an example of what I would describe as a hypothesis and the elements that need to go into it. The first three items are the most important. That's an understanding and a definition of the buyer or user, then a definition of what their market segment is and what problem they have. And so if I have some market evidence, I want to be able to turn that into a hypothesis that defines at least who I think the buyer or user is, what market segment they are in, and what that problem is. And then I want to go to the market and validate that as part of my discovery process. The uh, other components that you can include in your hypothesis is a definition of when this happens, if that is important to the hypothesis, and if you already have a concept in mind of how you can solve it, that can also be part of your hypothesis. But as your starting point, the most important aspect is that buyer and user, that market segment they are in, and what problem they have. Remembering that the market problem is the root for successful products. So I put an example here on this slide of a hypothesis. And the first part of the hypothesis is owners of small manufacturing operations that use hot water and steam are unable to man manage their manufacturing costs due to the volatility of fuel prices. So you see there the buyer and user is the owner. The market segment is small manufacturing operations that use hot water and steam. And the problem they have is they can't manage their manufacturing costs due to the volatility of fuel prices. Now in this particular case we also have a potential solution 
and then is a high temperature solar heating system which is delivered under a uh, lease agreement. A lease agreement being that they don't purchase it from you but they pay you a small fee on a monthly basis for the usage of it. And in this particular scenario is that the cost of the monthly payment is going to be less than what their typical uh, cost of using fuel would be to, uh, to um, do that. And so this is an example of a, how you might write a hypothesis and uh, that is the starting point for going out to the marketplace and verifying that that hypothesis is true. For those of you that studied uh, science, you would remember the scientific process. And the starting point of a, uh, of a scientific process is a hypothesis. And through testing of some form, you are going to confirm that the hypothesis is true or that it is not true. And so the better that you define the hypothesis, the better that you can either confirm it's not true or that it is true. So what is the process for confirming or validating that hypothesis? Well, it starts by going out and speaking to potential customers. And what you want to confirm is that the market problem that you've identified in your hypothesis and the market segment and the buyers within it are who are are true now most companies as i as i say here most companies don't or won't do this because it's hard to do it takes a time investment and for most of us we are uncomfortable doing this because it requires calling people and trying to engage in a conversation with people that we may not know. In English, we call that cold calling. So uh, making phone calls to people that fit the profile of the buyer and user that is part of our hypothesis and, uh, and talking to them about the, your hypothesis and receiving feedback as to whether that hypothesis is true with them or not. From my experience, this typically takes somewhere around 20 conversations to be able to go and confirm your hypothesis. Now, there are cases where you find out your hypothesis is wrong and that you are going to iterate on it or, or do some more learning from that, and that could take 100 conversations. And so that's the reason this becomes very difficult. There's one example of a company here in Austin, Texas, which is where I live, called uh, Spiceworks. And they had a hypothesis that the IT managers for small companies did not have the tools that they needed to successfully manage the information technologies, the networks, the computers, the different assets within their small organizations. And what they did is they went and spoke to a number of IT managers at these small businesses. They went and visited them face to face. They watched and observed how they did their work. They asked them questions. And from that, they came away with a very clear understanding of the problem and the market segment that they could not have done uh, without going through that process. And now, this is uh, five years later, they are a very successful uh, software company and uh, continue to grow and do very well. And so that's an example of going through this process and being able to use this kind of process to initiate the start of a successful company. The next thing that we want to do is once we have validated the first part of the hypothesis, which is the market problem and the market segment and the buyer and users, we want to validate the second part of the hypothesis, which is how we potentially can solve that problem. And the way that I like to talk about this is to create a concept. 
Okay, create a concept around your product and your business model. Now the important thing is, is that this is a very low cost investment. You might do a mock-up of your product. You might even go so far to do a prototype which has some actual functionality to it in a information technology or a software uh, environment, we might create some wireframes. We could do what's called a storyboard, which is we show how uh, our product would be used. And so we draw different pictures of saying, you start with this, and then you go and do this, and then you do this, like uh, movie producers would do. Or it could be a presentation. There is also uh, times where I've used a product description. I've just written out a paragraph or two paragraphs around the concept of the product and I share that with people and get their feedback. And you will, the thing that is always surprising is even with this low cost investment in presenting a product concept, it is a very successful uh, process and you get very good feedback. And so what you want to make sure is, one is, does the problem that we talked about, is that still a problem you feel? Does the approach that we presented to you, our, our product concept, solve that problem in an adequate manner? And the third part of what we want to understand from this is, what is the minimal viable product? And so if you haven't heard the term minimal viable product, the way to think of that is, what is the minimum product that we can develop that the marketplace is willing to pay for? That is, if you develop any less, they're not going to be willing to pay for it. But if you develop more, you develop more than you really need. And this all supports that opportunity to go to the market and to continue to learn uh, from the market. So now that we've validated our hypothesis, just because we had people in the marketplace confirm to us that yes, this is a problem and your approach to it is good, we also want to validate that it is actually a good opportunity. And the number one question that we want to address from that is, can it be profitable? So that uh, point there, can it be profitable, is that number one thing that we want to do. Just because some people have said that it's interesting to them, the fact that it is interesting doesn't necessarily mean it is profitable. And so if I am working within a company, that means I need to go and do research in the marketplace to confirm that it is a good opportunity and build a business case to justify the investment that we're going to make in that. If you are an entrepreneur, before you invest in building your own product, uh, if, if even if you're using your own resources, you want to spend some time making sure that not only are there people saying this is a problem and that you can solve it, but that the market is big enough and it is profitable enough for you to invest that time doing that. If you are an entrepreneur who is looking for investments from another investment or from a venture capitalist, you want to go and build out that business case or the business plan to show the opportunity can be profitable. And so that does require you to do uh, research. And that's going to be research the market in more detail and researching your competitors so that you can come up and under, so that you can identify how you are going to compete within the marketplace. To be able to go and build a business case, you, used, you, you most likely are going to have to have your product defined in more detail. And so as you're defining that product in more detail, you want to go back to those people you've spoken to in the past who said, we have that problem, we like your approach, we like your concept, and continue to validate with them that yes, this is the right approach to solve it. So we're continuing to keep our customer or our potential customer at the center of this process. 
So I mentioned the uh, minimal viable product. Part of what we want to do is identify that. And here is how, you know, uh, this is really the goal of that minimal viable product. So it's just enough functionality to solve the most important market problems. So somebody may have various dimensions to the problem, but you're going to focus initially on those that are most important. It can be for just a small market segment, so you don't have to satisfy the needs of the full marketplace that you envision, but you want to get something that you can get there quickly to the market and then be able to learn from that and continue to develop and refine that. Many uh, of my experiences and uh, other entrepreneurs that I have spoken to is that whatever you come take to the market first is probably not going to be 100% correct. And so the faster you can get out and get it to the market and learn something from that, the better you are. Because I do not want to invest a year or two years in developing a new product and find out that I'm wrong. I'd rather learn that in two months or three months or four months, even six months, than taking a long time to get that to the, uh, get, get into to the market. Then the last part of this is validating the market. So if you have going through the process that I have discussed of taking your hypothesis, speaking to buyers and users in your target market, you have validated the concept with those same people, you have validated the product as you're developing it, uh, those are also your, your first potential customers. You have developed a relationship with them. You have established a, uh, an understanding of their needs. You have created a product that meets, meets their needs. They've given you feedback on that. And so those should be your very first, uh, those should be your very first targeted customers. In the story that I mentioned about Spiceworks, that's exactly what they did. Is as soon as they had something ready, they went right back to the same people that uh, had told them these were the problems that they have and made them their first customers. And as you continue to grow your market, the key is you want to have a clear definition of who that target market is because we as companies or as entrepreneurs can never satisfy the needs of the full marketplace. It's too expensive for us to do. And so defining that target market based upon all the work that we've done, clearly defining who those buyers and users are, and then communicating to them the messages that allow them to understand how you can solve their problem. I like to break that into two aspects. One is the value proposition, which is what we can do for you. This is the value that we can deliver for you. And then the other side of that is your differentiation is why buy our solution? Okay, there are other people that may be able to deliver similar value, but we want you to buy our solution and here is the reason to do that. Even at this point in time, there is an opportunity to continue to discover, validate, and refine uh, your marketing plans, your marketing programs, and get feedback on how to improve your product. So this is the model that I've talked about. We've talked about the four key pillars being it all starts with a market problem and the better that we understand the market problem, then uh, we can build the right product and a business model to address that problem. And then we can create the right market strategy so that we are selling the product to those people that actually have a need for it. And the way that we get there is we start off with that hypothesis. We validate that the hypothesis is true. We validate that this is an opportunity worthy of investment. We then continue to validate the solution as we are developing it. And we eventually take it to the market where we receive the ultimate validation and uh, get achieve market growth from that. And all of this is that iterative, iterative discovery process that we do 
and keeping the customer or the potential customer at the center of the process. So finally, to summarize, here are the key principles, is that as you go through this, you will have a hypothesis. You're going to do discovery around that hypothesis to test it and to validate that it is true. We want to go and keep that continuous engagement with the target market. Okay, so we, that doesn't mean you want to talk to them every day, but when you have important decisions that need to be made, you want to go back and share uh, the, those potential decisions with them. And then, you know, we want to make sure that we are learning, that we're using this as a learning process. And if we're going to fail, we'd rather fail fast so that we can discover fast instead of failing later and not having the, that opportunity to discover from that. So with that, I thank you so much. Muchas gracias a todos. And uh, we have time here for any questions. And if you have questions, uh, we can put those into the chat window. And then uh, and I will try to work on uh, answering those uh, through that. Give me just a minute and I'll, I'll get on to those questions. Okay, question. What do you think about the idea that a good marketing can sell a really bad product? <laughs> I think there are probably some rare, uh, there are some rare uh, examples of where that may have actually happened. Now, you know, some people would say for, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to this from two points. If it's a really bad product, marketing is probably not going to help you be successful with it. Now, there may be some rare exceptions and rare examples of that occurring, but it is very unlikely likely that that would be the case. But there are definitely cases of where a product that is not necessarily technically better has been more successful in the marketplace because of marketing. And I think many people will look at Microsoft products, you know, from the early versions of Microsoft Word to Microsoft Windows, and they have been successful in the market a lot because that they were much better at marketing than the other competitors in the marketplace. And so, will it will it, will marketing overcome a very bad product? No, I don't think that will happen, except in very rare occasions. But if it is not necessarily technically superior to other alternatives, then marketing can overcome that. All right, I'm trying to keep on questions here. What's a better approach to get market feedback instead of uh, cold calling? So, okay, uh, there's two there. The first one is uh, I'm going to do is what's a better way to get market feedback? The I like to use an approach that I call warm calling. And so warm calling is where you use your friends and your business networks to make introductions for you. And so once you have defined as part of your hypothesis that uh, this, is the, uh, this is the market segment and this is the profile of buyer or user that we want to target, then we would approach that. We would go and uh, use, uh, use our uh, friends and networks to find people that meet that profile. Now, I always recommend that you look at LinkedIn, and I hope that most of you are already involved in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, are participating in LinkedIn. And if you have a good network on LinkedIn, then you can search for people that meet the profile that, uh, that you are looking for, and then use the request to use your network to get an introduction to those people. 
And I have found that to be pretty successful from my experience. But another thing is don't be afraid about talking to your friends and families and, and uh, business colleagues about what you are doing and asking them, do you know of somebody that meets this profile that you might be able to introduce me to? I was working on a product idea uh, some years ago and I, I was very open to people about what I was doing. And I was getting introductions into people that could help me better understand the opportunity because of that. I think there is oft, often uh, situations where uh, we are afraid as entrepreneurs to talk about a new idea because we think somebody is going to steal it. And that potentially could happen, but I think you even have a bigger risk of making a mistake if you don't talk about it because you want to find people that can help you uh, with the opportunity. There was one other question that was about, uh, you know, how does this you know, how does this compare to the, uh, the Lean Startup by Eric Ries? And it, th there's definitely some parallels uh, in what Eric Ries talks about. One of the points that I would differ with Eric Ries is that when you're developing a new product that people don't know what they want. And so, you know, his approach tends to go out, come up with an idea, and then go and get it there out quickly, test it get some feedback, test it again. And, and there, there are probably some scenarios where people you know, don't know what they want. But most importantly, what I've discovered is that people know what it is they want to do. They may not know what they, they want to use to do that, but they know what it is that they aren't able to do that they would like to be able to do. Or they know what they want to be able to do that is better. And so, you know, the process that I presented here is focus much heavily, much more heavily on the front end part of creating that hypothesis, uh, creating that hypothesis around the market problem and then going and discovering that market problem. Another question is how do you know you are spending too much time validating your theory before getting to creating the product? I, I, I didn't talk about that here, but in uh, when I do the full, I, I do a full workshop around this. And when we do the workshop, what we point at is at some point you start hearing the same things over and over again. And so, if you reach that point of in, in economics, we call the point of uh, see the point of marginal diminishing returns. That is, each visit that you make with a potential customer, you're learning less and less until you start to hear the same things over again, then at that point you know that you, you, there's no need to continue the conversations and I should get on to working with the product. So that, that would, uh, would be the point that I'd like to emphasize is, you know, use your judgment, but once you start to hear the similar answers and the similar information, you have probably done enough work of that initial validation of your uh, process. There was a, uh, I saw another question. Oh, there the question is, does this apply to products and services? The answer is yes. And here is uh, the key reason around that is even services are focused on solving a market problem. In the people that I have participated in my workshop, we have had people who are pro developing products, we have people who are providing services, and we have people that are uh, developing products or services across many different industries. And so uh, the answer is yeah, this process applies no matter what, because I can create a service without understanding the problem and still make a mistake on that. Another question, do you think it's always possible to improve a product that already exists in the market? Which are your best advice in this case? And how do you identify that? So the answer is yes, it is, uh, it is possible to improve. The question is, is how much of an improvement has to be done 
to be able to have somebody make a change. And I've had a conversation with uh, uh, different people who have studied this, and I think every scenario is going to be different, but if I can improve the way that somebody does something by around 30 or 40 percent, then there's clearly an opportunity. Now, there are many factors that go into that. That is, how hard is it for somebody to make a change? So, for example, you know, we look at uh, smartphones. You know, the smart, most of us have a smartphone these days, but the companies are constantly coming out with new smartphones. And it's because they are able to make improvements in those smartphones that are important enough for us that we're willing to go and stop using our old smartphone and change to a new smartphone. Now, if I'm, a, if I'm in a company with a large manufacturing process and somebody comes up with a new way of manufacturing the product that I am manufacturing, but it requires me to replace my complete manufacturing line, then that's a harder change for me to do. And so that's really what you have to look at is how big of improvement does somebody need to be able to achieve to make a change to a new product that is in the market. Let's see, question. If you improve a product by adjusting it to your local regulations and law and try to sell it, would that be an advisable endeavor? The question, uh, here's the important question is, is if it's just based upon, uh, you know, adapting to the local, local regulations and laws, you know, the answer is yes, you, you do want to do that, but does that actually differentiate differentiate you, you know, from other products? So that's if other products are already meeting their local regulations and laws, then that's probably not an improvement that's going to give you an advantage. But if there are products in the marketplace that people are using because that is the only uh, thing available but it does not necessarily match up to the local practices or regulations and laws, then yes, there, there would be an opportunity associated with that. Let me see if I can find any other questions in here that I've missed so far. I don't see any right now. Oh, here's another one. How do you follow the footsteps of successful business models without being considered a copycat? There is a, um, there are some times that being a copycat is okay. And so the key in that particular uh, case is that you you probably cannot differentiate just based upon the business model. You know, if you are going to copy somebody else's business model, you're going to have to find another way to differentiate yourself. And, you know, you might do that because you're able to deliver your product at a lower cost. You may have better benefits that you can deliver than uh, what the originator of that business model did. You may have, uh, let me think, you, uh, see I thought about cost, better uh, benefits. There may be some market segments that you can serve that the, uh, that the person that originated the idea cannot better serve. And so that is, uh, you know, where you might do that. So yeah, I, I don't think there's any problem with copying a business model or even copying somebody's product idea but you have to be able to find a way that you can do something better for a particular market segment than what that competitor does. There was a question about the uh, revenue. Um, I don't have a book on it. I do have it as a course. And if you go to my website, which uh, you can find here, uh, you can register. There's a place that you can register to find out about upcoming information and also uh, I'm talking to uh, the software guru team about 
uh, hosting this as a workshop. And so look forward uh, to doing, doing that. What's, let's see, what's a better push? Okay, we talked about the cold calling. Okay, what is the suggested approach for cold calling? Many companies would be reluctant at first if you ask them directly. So this is where this hypothesis that I talked about is uh, very important. And let me see if I can go back to that slide. There we go. Yep. So the, the hypothesis. And so the way, this is something that I learned in sales. I, I did some sales in the past. And what I learned is, is if you can call up the buyer or the owner or the, uh, the user that you want to talk to, and you can start the conversation by identifying that you understand their problems, that that creates credibility for you. And so having this hypothesis is a great starting point. So for example, with the hypothesis that I have here, if I call, try to call the owner of a small manufacturing operation, and I'm able to get them on the phone, and I say, you know, Mr. Owner, you know, we have been speaking to other small manufacturing operations like yours, and one of the concerns they have expressed to us is that they have a challenge in managing their costs due to the volatility of fuel prices. You know, I'd like to talk to you to understand more about how does that impact you. And so that that is how you use that. You know, start those conversations. Now, it may be true. They may not go and give you insight into all of their processes and uh, and uh, you know the way that they do things, but by at least by identifying you understand those problems, that is a great starting point for initiating that conversation because that shows that you understand their problems and you're credible about that. Let's see. Somebody made a, a point that. You know, even market research, that nothing ever ensures the success of a product. And that, that is true. There is nothing that is ever going to ensure the success of a product because doing a new product and taking a new product to the market is always going to be a risky, uh, in, uh, a risky uh, in, endeavor. And so the more that you do from a market research, from a validating with your customer's perspective, this is going to significantly increase your chances of success. All right, the last question here, do you recommend starting local or always start global, especially when it is about scalable uh, and you know the market would welcome the app? Okay. I, I, I think that I would always start with maybe a more local environment or a lo more local market to reach out to uh, the people that are closest to me that I have the easiest to access, but I would always want to keep an eye on the, uh, the global market. And so anytime I learn something from a local aspect, I would want to go and do maybe do some research on a global basis to make sure that whatever I'm doing does not uh, prevent me from being able to go and do a global I know that, uh, and this is from, uh, you know, from my experience of, uh, you know, speaking with companies throughout Latin America, one of the things I do find is that a lot of comp products that companies have developed are, especially software products, are very locally oriented. And so for them to be able to go and take it into a global market on a longer term would be difficult to do without doing a lot of work on it. And so... Uh, you know, again, based upon that, I think, yes, you know, start local, but always keep an eye, always be thinking about what the global market needs might look like so that you don't have to make any drastic changes as you uh, have that opportunity. All right. I think we have reached 1 o'clock, and that is the end of the time. I have my contact information here. 
uh, with my email address. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that too. But please, uh, don't hesitate to follow up with me and ask any questions that you have via email. I'll be glad to uh, try to respond to those. And then, as uh, Software Guru has mentioned here, we are looking at offering this workshop uh, at par as part of their programs. And uh, hopefully, you'll hear some uh, news about that in the future. So with that, I say, uh, again, muchas gracias. And uh, we'll talk with you later. Thank you very much, Tom. Muchas gracias you. para todos. Los invitamos a la siguiente sesión, que es de Intel, de desarrollo para aplicaciones para Windows 8. Y muchas gracias y seguimos en contacto. Thank mm -hmm. you.